Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Very happy today to be joined by John Moxley. How's life over there, John? Uh, pretty good, man. Just doing some media today, plugging some pay-per-views and so forth, you know? Getting you know, stuff done. I, uh, I've watched uh, uh, most of your career, in fact, and... Uh, you know, I rarely did I ever think, you know, me and John Moxley have got some stuff in common. But uh, amazingly, in 2021, I mean, we're going to bond on this program about your, your, uh, you're now an author. We both hate Zoom. Uh, both, uh, you're about to be a father. It's crazy the way that, that things change here. So let's get started with fatherhood. I mean, you're, is it June 11th your child is due? Yeah, I mean, she's, uh, that would be yeah that's like the official date but you know i've heard people two weeks before two weeks after right so basically it's it could come at any moment it could be coming right now like it could come during the show like it's that like i don't know but hopefully uh hopefully it goes fully to the term and everything yeah so uh yeah it's pretty uh it's weird man it is a weird time She's walking around pointing his belly at me. It's like a giant loaded missile. Could explode oh. at any moment. Is is it ever? Like, oh, Jesus. Now, it's now tense. Did she, it's tense. Has she had any, what are the oddest urges? Has she had any odd food urges? Obviously, she's got the cookbook and, and all this sort of stuff. Has she had this sort of weird thing that she has made you run Dude, out Dude, she ate the book. The, <laughs> it's, she would. But, yeah, uh, peanut butter, man. Lots of peanut butter. Oh, yes. It's not like we're, yeah, we're just restocking peanut butter. Like, it's ridiculous. It's none, none but peanut butter. You could, she could make some fancy dinner and be like, oh, I'm going to make this. Because she's like, oh, I have to cook something. And I'm like, I don't, I'm like, why are you going to bother with all your preheating and putting this stuff out hours beforehand and letting it marinate? But it's like, you know, you're just going to stare at it and decide you want a peanut butter sandwich. Because you're like, you're crazy because you're pregnant and there's hormones and, so I was like, wait, you know, it, 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 no matter what, like, our plans are, she always end up eating, like, peanut butter sandwich or, like, cereal or whatever. So I'm cool with whatever, you know. So You know, yeah, it's funny. Pretty, uh, I, I, was, wild. I was thinking about this because we're going to talk about your book here in a moment. But uh, I'm sure that you, you, uh, you've you been working very hard, obviously. You're writing the book yourself. And then, obviously, once you write the book, then they've got to do all of the editing, and then you've got to pick all of the pictures, and it's like, there's so much to do in putting a book together. And when it's finally done, and they're like, there's nothing more for you to do, there's like this huge feeling of relief, and there's like all of this time that you have back, because you've been spending so much time on the book. And I was thinking, man, he's going to be so happy when he just finds he has all this time again. But then you're going to have a child, and all that time is gone again. You're not going to get no. that free time, dude. All the timing was so bad. Like having a because, dude, writing a book is hard, man. And like you said, I wrote every single word of this. I couldn't stomach the thought of a ghostwriter like putting words in my mouth or whatever. So if I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it, which I didn't even want to do it. And then I was like, once I'm committed, now I'm going to, it's going to be good. So, uh, it's, it's an, it, it's the more the most mentally and emotionally draining things that I've ever done. I knew it was going to be a lot of hours. I knew it was going to be like, okay, this is going to take a long time to sit down and type all this stuff and write it all down and all this and craft it in my mind or whatever. But, I didn't realize like how draining, how draining it would really be, especially like when you, uh, oh, and I guess my point is also, so it demands an incredible amount of your time and attention, but also a pregnant wife demands an incredible amount of your time and attention. Yes. So having those two things at the same time pulling against each other when you're like, I got to get some work done. Cause you can't just say, I'm going to sit down for two hours and write a thousand words because it doesn't work like that. You might stare at the screen and nothing might come out or you might get on a, in the zone. And what, if you get a flow going, you got to keep it going. You got to drop everything you're doing and just stay in the zone. At least that's how it was for me anyway. You know, I've never written anything before, but, uh, so it was, it was really cool. But, uh, and yeah, just the, uh, the, especially like going into like, it was way more emotionally and mentally exhausting than I had planned. And when you it's just to, uh, to go back to these places and like, you, you got to really get in the mindset of where you were 
it's much like doing a promo. Like I kind of figured, it's like learning to write. I've never written anything in my life. I've not. I didn't even graduate high school. Like I have no skills uh, officially. I'm just, I'm self taught with everything. Right. I have like a fourth grade level math education. You know, but I'm pretty good with words. Uh, Another thing to bond over. So yeah. Uh, so it's almost like learning a new instrument, like cutting a promo or thinking of a promo in your head is one thing. And it's kind of like that. It's just, it was the longest promo I've ever written in my life. It was like a m- promo that was months and months long instead of, or a bunch of different promos that were took days or weeks at a time, as opposed to two minutes. And like, I don't write stuff down because then I feel locked into something. And if I write it down, then it's something that I can potentially forget. I'd, I'd like to just have it all kind of in my head loosely and then just spit it how it comes out naturally. So, like, it was a different kind of skill set to put it words on paper and tell a story. But kind of it's all kind of the same kind of the same skill set. It's kind of just like learning a new instrument, like switching from bass guitar to guitar or something. And once I started to pick it up and kind of learn, kind of develop, like, a, I dare say, like a writing style, then I kind of started to get into it and it started to be fun. And, uh, like, at first, I was not into the idea of an autobiography. I was like, no, thank you. It almost felt like a little like pretentious. So I was just like, nobody needs to read like my life story. It's not even that interesting. I'm just a wrestler. Like, I'm not a former president or anything. Like, we don't need my memoirs, okay? Like, nobody needs to read that. And just the thought of like, all these books are like these linear stories. Like, I was born here, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and now it's today. And that was not interesting or inspiring to me at all. But once I started kind of thinking about, okay, well, if I was going to do it, Maybe I would do something like this. Uh, and the thought of creating like a piece of artwork, like a singular piece of work, that was intriguing to me. And I, when I first started doing it, I was kind of looking at this book. Willie Nelson has a couple of books called like, he's got one called Roll Me Up and Smoke Me When I Die or The Tao of Willie, which is a very light, easy, fun read. They're short they're not, uh, they're just kind of tell some stories and kind of some life Willie Nelson lessons, philosophies and jokes. And you kind of just get a sense of what it's like to hang out with Willie Nelson. It's not very, it's not to be taken very seriously. That's kind of how I originally pictured it. Just a very, very fun, light kind of thing. I was like, I could maybe do something like that. That could be fun. So a lot of stuff that's in there from the early days of writing is very, very fun and light and just plain stupid and just like, just for fun, like just easy, not serious writing. Then as we got into like the meteor chunks and stuff, it's like, well, if I'm going to tell this, I've got to put it all into context. If I'm going to go into it, I got to really go into it. So then, then it became much more of an autobiographical thing than I had anticipated. And then about halfway through, I started getting kind of a vision for what it would be. And then it, then it started to get exciting that I almost kind of picture it like, uh, like an album or a record, like with an opening track and a ballad and up and down and everything and a close. And it, uh, it will encompass kind of everything for everything from my earliest memories of wrestling to things that happened as recently as a couple of weeks ago. So it's like all over the map. And, uh, you know, to go back to it, like if I'm going to cut a promo, you know, I need to get, if I'm thinking of one, whether it's the night before or the day before, or a week before, or an hour before, I have to mentally get in the headspace that this is real and this is where I'm at. Now, so to, go, to get in the headspace of going back to these places over a decade ago or a decade ago where, where life was different and you were in a different situation and things weren't the same as they are now, like getting into that headspace was like really emotionally and mentally challenging. So I'm very proud of, you know, what if what it put together, you know, it's, and I, I will say that it's definitely, I can't say it's any better than any other book. I can say with certainty, it's completely different than any of the other wrestling books you, that you will read. Now we got about uh, two minutes here, but very quickly, you mentioned it being draining and I've heard a million interviews with you over the years. And whenever you talk about your pre wrestling life, you've always been pretty vague about it. Like, you know, you, you suggested things and things, difficulties and that sort of thing, but you never really went in depth in it. And in this book, you do. And was this the first time that you ever told some of these stories? And was that one of the draining aspects of going back and writing about this stuff? 
Yeah, and uh, to that was kind of another rule of mine was to try to avoid just recapping stuff that happened on TV. Like at this pay-per-view, I wrestled so-and-so, and then I won this belt, and then I wrestled this person the next pay-per-view. People already saw that on TV. It already happened. So, like, I'm not giving you any new information. You can see that on – you can see that, right? You already saw it. So it was important for me to make sure that m- most everything was completely new information that – stories that nobody's ever heard before – or if it's about a subject that did play out on TV, because obviously I talk about stuff that happened on TV, but you're seeing it from my perspective, from a different perspective, from like the very inside baseball kind of uh, perspective. So there's no just really recapping of just events that happened on TV. So like everything, it's very important that everything be new information as much as possible. So there'd be a ton of stuff that nobody's ever heard before. All right, we're going to head to a break here in just a moment, and when we come back, we'll talk more about the book, and then obviously this weekend we have got the pay-per-view, and we'll talk about the matches uh, on the show and those that you were involved in as well. So stick around, everybody. Back in a moment, Observer Live. And Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sembravivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. John Moxley is joining us here today, and we had a fella here in the chat that wants me to tell you that uh, the meet-and-greet with you and Eddie sold out faster than anybody else. Add that to your resume. I would, I would assume that would, would be the case. That's right. So your book, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, because uh, a lot of times, you know, people will read a book and they'll say, man, I could hear you saying that in your voice. And if ever there was a book where you can hear some a man's voice as you read this book, it is your book. Uh, this is, like you said, it's basically like you cutting a promo. I mean, if you try to imagine... What do I imagine a John Moxley book reading like? I mean, that's what this book is. It's just like, I don't want to say it's a stream of consciousness, but it kind of is a stream of consciousness, some of these chapters. I don't know how it's going to be after they edit it, but it's you talking to the reader about various things that occurred in your lifetime. And did they give you any sort of, hey, do it like this or do it like this? Or was it sort of, write this book? Give it to us, and we'll do what we can do. No, yeah, it was it was whatever you want, whatever you want it to be. Like this is completely independent of any uh, independent of AEW or WWE or any company. Or this is just me. There's, there's no other. There's no company line to tow, or there's no any not anybody to appease or anything. Like it's it's whatever. Uh, and even like talking to the editor and stuff, like you know, they'll he they'll put in like periods and commas and stuff like that. But like, it's made very clear that like words don't get put in my mouth. Like this, and I was like, it's gonna look dirty. It's gonna look terrible because it's gonna be like how I talk. Like I, I once I started kind of figuring this out, I was just like, okay, I'm gonna write the way I would talk, even though I'm put like if I say like, oh yeah, I like wrestling and crap see him on the radio and I know I can't cuss because I'm a professional. Right? So say I would say like, uh, uh, you know, I like wrestling stuff and crap. That's how I would say it. So I'll write it like that, even though that looks terrible, but that's how I would say it. So it's like, it's, I very much wrote it with like, how would I read it if this were an audio book? So I wanted to sound exactly like me. So it's very, it, you hit it on the head. It's a very stream of consciousness. Like there's some stuff where I'm like, what am I even talking about? I'm just like, but once you get on a roll, you're going all over the place. So I'm like, okay, just keep going and see what's up. And then there are like other times where you're like, I'm three, four hours deep in this. I'm on the porch. I'm like slamming beers and like chewing nicotine gum and trying to stay awake. And I'm like, I'm almost there. I almost got it. I just want, I get, and then you see like, oh, I got it. This is the closing line that brings us all together. And it's kind of like when you come up with a really cool idea for like a line in a promo or what I imagine like writing a song would be like, uh, where you're like, boom, that's it. And you're like, gone. And then you write and you're like, oh man, that rules. Like, so it's pretty satisfying like that. To, like I said, it's kind of like learning a new skill or whatever. So it's, but it's very, it's very much in my voice. Uh, nobody's going to screw with me at all as far as like editing and so forth. Like it's going to look raw and going to look dirty. Uh, literary critics will hate it. That's fine. It's not for them. It's for wrestling fans. Uh, you know, I wanted to. I wanted to write it like for the wrestling fan. That's another thing that annoys me about some books is like when they go too out of their way to explain stuff. 
Like I don't want to like I don't want to waste any time going. Anyway, I work for this company called WWE. They're the biggest company in the world. They are owned by Vince McMahon. Started in 1963 by Jess McMahon. Like we don't need all that. We we know what WWE is. If I'm talking about Vince McMahon, I can just say Vince. Like 99 percent of the people reading it are gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. So like I gotta figure that out halfway where I'm like I'm, I don't want to waste any time like explaining what terms mean. Like if I say hard way or something like that or. Uh, kayfabe or work or shoot or so you know like I just, at some point i just said like screw all these like we're not gonna we're just gonna write it the way i explained it to him i was like it's like you didn't know anything about pro wrestling but one night you hung out at a party and you got drunk and did a bunch of coke with these wrestlers and they were all sitting around in a circle talking to each other and they were using these terms and talking about what you draw last night? There was twenty thousand people, kayfabe, hard way, all the, you know, and they're just talking about it like you were just a fly on the wall. But you get to hang out with them, and then the next day you'd be like, "Dude, it was cool. I was hanging out with these wrestlers. They were talking about all this wrestling stuff. It was awesome." So you get to see. So you feel like I want it to feel like you're like part of the locker room or like you're in the ring, you know, as opposed to like talking down to you like you've never heard of who Hulk Hogan was or something like that. Uh, now I don't want to. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to spoil the book here. And actually, I can't spoil the book because I haven't read it from start to finish in order. But the impression I've been given is that when you started writing this book, you didn't necessarily know like how you were going to end the book. But then circumstances, I believe, arose, and you ended up having a perfect ending. Is that right? Yeah, I like the I mean, but it's kind of like uh, the story's still going, though. Sure. Know? But uh, a perfect so conclusion to this like, book. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of the the way it ended. Ended up just like perfect in hindsight, but it was it was stumbled into it. But uh, I can't spoil anything. But cool thing is, it's kind of like it's still going because it's uh, it's just kind of like you're along with me on the highway of like all these crazy all these crazy pit stops along the way, and the book ends and we fill up the car and we get back on the highway and we go. So like. There could be, you know, maybe there'll be a sequel. If nobody likes this book, then there won't be. Or maybe I don't have anything else to say. I don't know. But uh, y- 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 it definitely, y- the whole thing will kind of come full circle and encompass. And it's it's kind of funny that you kind of learn about, like, when you go back and look at stuff, you kind of learn more about yourself, too. And you realize, like, how you got here. And you kind of learn more about your own experiences. When you go, like, oh, yeah, well, that happened when I was 12. And then that happened when I was 22. And then it happened when I was 30. And I reacted the same way every single time. So you like almost learn more about yourself. And uh, like this definitely isn't like a book where where there's like a definitive point where everything changes. Like, oh, I went and found Jesus and then everything is cool now. I used to be an asshole, but now I'm cool. There's none of that. This is, I started this way. And there are, you mature and evolve and whatever, but I'm basically the same person. You just kind of see how you grow through life and learn along the way and make mistakes and everything. It's very unapologetic. If anybody gets buried in the book, it's me. You know, I don't, I don't really care. And it, like, you, I'm the kind of guy. If you were like, oh, you're acting like you're some big shot author now, but like, I got a Polaroid of you smoking crack out of a stripper's butt from 2008. I'd be like, yeah, sure, that happened. Big deal. Give me the Polaroid. Put it on Twitter. I don't care. Like, who cares? Like, I did that. You know, or whatever. So we've all been. If there. I was unapologetic <laughs> about who I am before this book, now that I've kind of gone through it and been like, I feel like I even know myself a little better. No, I'm ten times more unapologetic about who I am as a person. This coming weekend, we've got the AEW pay-per-view, and uh, it is you and Eddie Kingston versus the Young Bucks. In some ways, a battle of authors here for the AEW Tag Team titles. Their books came out last year, their book, The Young Bucks. And uh, you've, of course, as noted, I mean, this baby could come at any time. So all we can do is hope that uh, this match goes off as planned this coming weekend. Any thoughts on the match? You got a lot on your mind. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's almost like I'm still kind of in shell shock. I'm kind of coming up from air from the whole thing. Just like, oh, what the hell just happened? I've been like, I have a nose to the grindstone for so long. I'm like, coming back to reality. So now it's a nice change of pace to be like, okay, let's do some wrestling. Let's just focus on we got a tag team match with one of the best tag teams in the world, and I got a great partner. I've been blessed with some good tag team partners over the years. Uh, Sammy Callahan, I was ready to shield, and now I got Eddie Kingston, who's my best friend in business. So, like, 
and it's so much fun. Like we just like getting to work with him is like it's not even work. It's just like especially promos and stuff. Like we just show up to the spot where they tell us there's going to be a camera, and we just start riffing, and whatever they get, they get. They keep telling me that the real money is going to be in like the the outtake footage of just me and Eddie riffing for an hour. And then stuff that they just refuse to put on TV. But, like, the crew guys and everybody in the room is cracking up. And they're like, they could release, like, a four-disc DVD of the outtakes. You know, so, like, that's just pure fun. It's not even, like, work, you know? You actually, you did a promo last week. And it was, like, right in the middle of this promo, there was a very obvious edit. (laughs) It was, like, it was was one camera. Like, it was clearly something happened. They decided they had to take out. Do you remember what that was? Oh, no, we were probably there for 20 minutes. We probably walked up to the spot, talked to each other for 20 minutes, er, laughed with each other or whatever, and then, like, walked off, and they just got whatever they got, you know? And it's it's so much fun. It's so effortless. Because that's how me and him are in real life. Like, when I seen him, when he came to AEW on the first night, I hadn't actually seen him in years. Because, you know, you get on two different roads and two different paths in this business. Sometimes you just don't see people for a long time. And there are some people in life that, like, you know, you see them after you were friends with them in, like, a different time. And then you see them again. Now they have kids and this and that, or they're, and they're different. And he's just not the same anymore. But him, like, 30 seconds after seeing him, it was like, it was like I'd seen him yesterday. It was like we just picked up right where we left off. Like, nothing changed. He was the same. I was the same. And I was like, man, I feel like I saw you, like, last week. But I haven't even seen you in years. You know? So that's just how we are in real life. And in a ring we have the same kind of mentality where like, okay, this is especially when we get together and kind of feed off each other's aggression and anger and so forth that our mentality is a tag team, the matches we've had on dark and uh, put a great match on uh, dynamite against the acclaimed who is a great team. I like working with them a lot. I work with them any day of the week. I think they're going to be like a top level team. So like that was fun, but you know, we go out there. It's like to us, this is a fist fight outside it's 2.30 in the morning, the bar is closed, and somebody's been talking trash, and they're going to get their teeth knocked out of the throat. Somebody's getting a, somebody's getting a steel toe boot right in the jaw. And, like, the cops are going to come and sort it out, and it is what it is, but, like, something's got to go down. That's kind of our uh, general flow as a team in the ring, which is very different from the Young Bucks, who are very smooth and athletic and so forth. So that's going to be a nice juxtaposition of styles, and we're going to be trying to bash their heads in and they're going to be doing the things that they do. We've been invited to a super kick party. So I've been working on my super kick. So I'm not, oh, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to be out there throwing left and right super kicks every which way. And, you know, they're going to be beautiful and graceful. And it's just going to be, I'm going to be a super kicking machine. Well, I hope you've been training by, by watching Pride, old Pride tapes, uh, because your super kick, I'd like to see be a soccer kick to those guys, and I'm sure Eddie could oh. deliver a couple of those I- as well. You know, you guys teaming up together, you know, for, for people in the locker room, for people that have known Eddie for a long time, there are a lot of fans that have just said, why can't people see this promo? Why can't people see the connection he has with a lot of other real people and, and really put this guy on, give him a chance? It took this long to do it. Does it feel good for you and the people that have worked with this guy for so long that now this guy's getting his roses? Oh, 100%. Also, real quick, I was totally kidding. I'm not throwing any super kicks because nobody <laughs> needs to see that. Have you ever seen somebody try to roller skate drunk? That's what it would look like if I tried to throw a super kick. Nobody needs to see that. But, yeah, uh, Eddie, for me, he as soon as – the thing is, he's never had, like, a full-time schedule where he's out in front of thousands and thousands of people every week on – national tv as soon as we start touring again and getting big crowds back again we're gonna have big crowds weekend he's gonna be so over in front of live people he's gonna be so beloved in all these talented and markets he's never even been to and it's gonna blow his mind i can't wait to see it because i'm gonna be standing right there and that all that uh all that work will have paid off in spades uh you know in the 11th hour you know and uh to just hang in there for that long and grind it out for that long. It's finally like it's coming. All these rewards are now rushing to him. It's like such a great thing to see, you know, because you can't, you can't win in the 11th hour if you quit in the 10th hour. And uh, it's just a great like lesson for people. And it's just such a feel good story. And just to, just to have him, just to be like, I was going out there with Eugene Nagata 
And just to well, have actually, Eddie by it. my side Sorry. next to me, yeah, hold pumping that. me up. He was more pumped up than I was. It's, it's just fun to have your friend out there with you. Yes, hold that thought back in a moment, everybody. Rest- and Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. If you head to my Twitter right now, at Brian Alvarez. Link to John Moxley's new book. And Renee's book has been out for about a week now, so you can head up there and check that out as well, her cookbook. And, John, we got about 90 seconds here, so let's get some plugs in. AW, your book, whatever you want. Yeah, obviously, remember, Dynamite is on Friday this week. Uh, I almost forgot that and went to the airport yesterday, so uh, don't be ashamed of yourself. But uh, I'm telling you right now, it's on Friday, so Friday night, uh, make sure you get Dynamite, the go-home show for, for Double or Nothing. Marked two years since AEW uh, came on the map, and uh, it's been a hell of a hell of a two-year ride. Me and Eddie Kingston are going to squash these young bucks like a couple of grapes, pop their heads like a couple of watermelons, stomp all over them, make some wine out of it. Then we're going to drink the wine and go get all messed up. And then we're going to celebrate with our tag team championships. Uh, and definitely pre-order this book, uh, this book called Mox. That's a bunch of nonsense. I apologize for uh, trying to get you to read it, but uh, hopefully wrestling fans enjoy it. You know, it's, it's about my love of wrestling and it's for the wrestling fan. And hopefully it's the kind of book that you read and be like, man, I'm going to go watch some wrestling. Cause Wrestling's awesome, you know. It's what we all are here for while we're gathered on this radio show today. You know, it's the thing we love. That's why we're going to be there on Sunday to watch uh, another great AEW pay-per-view like we always put on. And, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's a good time to be a wrestling fan. You know, the world's turning around. So let's all get together this weekend and watch some wrestling, man. Yep, check it out this weekend. The AEW pay-per-view will, of course, be plugging here on the show. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. And, uh, John, I want to thank you for doing the show here today. And uh, best of luck with a lot of things. The book, the pay-per-view, New Child, all sorts of great things coming up for you. So thanks again. And, of course, thanks, everybody, for listening. Mike, as always, callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live. If you enjoy these videos for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.